Good evening and welcome to Aware on the Air for the 16th week of 2013. Aware is the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group. I'm Carl Estabrook. It's Tuesday, April 16th, the day after the bombings at the Boston Marathon that killed three people and injured and maimed over a hundred. I lived in Boston for many years. The bombings occurred at one of my favorite places in town, across the street from the new public library. One of the people killed was an eight-year-old from Dorchester, the, sec the section of the city where my children grew up. No suspects have emerged, but many think these attacks are connected with the U.S. wars in the Middle East. Some have even remarked on their similarity to President Obama's drone attacks, which are often directed at public gatherings and have killed many civilians, including hundreds of children. Like the 9-11 attacks themselves, the Boston attacks look like blowback, counterattacks to a generation of American killing in the Mideast. Yesterday, on the same day three people were killed in Boston, 55 people were killed by bombings in Iraq, along with 32 other random killings in the country that the U.S. invaded and occupied a decade ago. There were 34 war-related deaths in Afghanistan, where the U.S. now has more troops fighting than it did during the Bush administration, and seven Palestinians were reported killed by Israelis in the occupation by America's chief Mideast ally. In his inaugural address in January, President Obama said a decade of war is now ending. But that's not true, and of course he knows it's not true. There is in fact no plan to end U.S. combat, even in Afghanistan, only an announced goal to lower troop levels in that country within 12 months. But even that will leave more U.S. troops in Afghanistan than there were when Obama became president. And Obama's war is by no means limited to AFPAC, the American war theater that includes Afghanistan and Pakistan. The Obama administration has now even employed, deployed troops to 35 African countries, beginning with Libya, Sudan, Algeria, and Niger. Today, the U.S. is threatening, invading, and occupying countries in a vast circle with a 2,500-mile radius around the Persian Gulf from North Africa to the borders of India and China, a region sometimes called the Greater Middle East. The U.S. military calls it Central Command. This region has the world's largest concentration of oil and natural gas, and our government is spending hundreds of billions of dollars month after month to control it. Control and not just access to these energy resources is what our government demands. We, in fact, import little of our own oil supplies from the Mideast. Most of it comes from the Western Hemisphere, notably Canada and Venezuela. But control of world energy supplies gives the U.S. an unparalleled advantage over our economic rivals in Europe and Asia. As a result, the bulk of our military budget, on which the U.S. spends more than the rest of the world combined, is spent on controlling oil routes in oil-rich regions. Middle East oil security has cost the U.S. $7.3 trillion over three decades, according to a Princeton professor in a new energy policy journal analysis. In other words, President Obama is killing men, women, and children in Asia and Africa in our name because China and other countries need oil, and our government intends to have control over where they get it. Our government says that we're conducting these vastly expensive wars to stop terrorism and protect civilians. But we can see that instead we're killing civilians and creating terrorists. These wars are not in Americans' interest because it's the 1% who profit from them through armaments and oil. The Obama administration's innovation in the U.S. war in the Mideast and Africa is to add assassinations by drone and death squad. The U.S. Special Operations Command is now, amazingly enough, active in 120 countries, according to the command spokesman. The U.S. has some 800 military bases in 150 countries around the world. President Obama has killed between 3 and 5,000 people, including at least 200 children, with drone attacks on Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen 
countries with which we are not at war, and some of which are supposed to be our allies. Jonathan Landi, Landy of uh, McClatchy Newspapers has recently published proof that the United States has lied in its drone wars. The U.S. has deliberately targeted for death by drone, group, by drone groups other than al-Qaeda. The CIA killed people who were only suspected, associated with, or who probably belonged to militant groups. Less than 2% of those killed in drone strikes in Pakistan were described by the government's own classified documents as senior members of al-Qaeda. In different circumstances, President Obama recently said there's no country on earth that would tolerate missiles raining down on its citizens from outside its borders. He was speaking of Israel. Of course, that's exactly what he's doing, including killing American citizens with his rockets. Obama's problem is the American people, who in spite of the media's silence about the ongoing war, or cheerleading for it, do not want more war. Therefore, Obama wants to find an effective way to lie to them that the war is winding down even as he expands it. President Bush, in addition to launching a lying invasion of Iraq 10 years ago, kidnapped people around the world and tortured them in Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. Obama simply murders them and hopes Americans won't notice. History will record that our chief executive is a practice liar as well as a murderer. The program of the current administration seems to consist of assassination, austerity, and anti-environmentalism, just as the 1% desire. You're watching Aware on the Air. Aware of the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana is made up of people who believe that if Americans actually knew what the U.S. government is doing in their name, they would be appalled. Tonight we'll have some comments from members and friends of AWARE, and then some videos on the war and the interest promoting it. And we'll start with Ron Zoak, Cat Exits Bag. Ron? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, <clears throat> I'm going to concentrate, uh, at first anyway, on a uh, article that appeared in this morning's uh, New York Times Online. The headline being, U.S. Practice Torture After 9-11, a nonpartisan review concludes. So uh, it's becoming uh, undeniable, although I think many will still prefer to try to deny it or to uh, <coughs> restate it, but uh, we'll see. Uh, this is by Scott Shane. A nonpartisan, independent review of interrogation and detention programs in the years after the September 11, nine, uh, 2001 terrorist attacks concludes that, quote, it is indisputable that the United States engaged in the practice of torture, end of quote, and that the nation's highest officials bore ultimate responsibility for it. The sweeping 577-page report says that while brutality has occurred in every American war, there never uh, before had been that kind of, quote, considered and detailed discussions that occurred after 9-11 directly involving a president and his top advisors on the wisdom, propriety, and legality of inflicting pain and torture, uh, torment on some detainees in our custody. The study by an 11-member panel convened by the Constitution Project, a legal research and advocacy group, is to be released on Tuesday morning. I think that means uh, this morning, uh, April 16th, 2013. So. Uh, <laughs> This goes on. Uh, what they mean by calling this nonpartisan, uh, I'm not sure. Independent, independent of what, I always have to ask. And uh, uh, what they're trying to avoid, of course, is the accusation of bias, which is freely thrown around uh, these days. Anyone who says anything that I dislike or disagree with is biased, of course. Uh, so. Uh, they're using the same line that whenever there's a United Nations resolution, for example, anyway critical of Israel, the United States will either uh, veto it or uh, the Israelis will reject it and ignore it, claiming that it is biased and uh, unbalanced and uh, so can be ignored. This report deals with what came to be called enhanced interrogation. Uh, it became crucially important that it not that these tactics uh, of causing pain and suffering to people 
uh, we're not called torture because that is so uh, clearly uh, contrary to both international law and American law. So we had to call it uh, something else, the waterboarding, uh, the uh, other tactics that were used. This report says the, the use of torture uh, had no justification and damaged the standing of our nation, reduced our capacity to convey, convey moral censure when necessary, and potentially increased the danger to U.S. military personnel taken captive. So uh, the enemy uh, out there in these foreign countries can refer to the uh, same kind of rationale. It's a uh, matter of uh, military necessity or national security that they start uh, torturing captured uh, Americans. And uh, we never seem to think of that when we're whipping up these legal rationales. And of course, there are always a uh, core of legal whores who are available to provide a lengthy and detailed and very impressive justification of anything that uh, the uh, powerful or the wealthy uh, want to do. Interrogation and abuse at the CIA's so-called black sites, the Guantanamo Bay prison in Cuba and war zone detention centers have been described in considerable detail by the news media and in declassified documents, although the Constitution Project has many uh, additional details. The report's main significance may be its attempt to assess what the United States government did in the years after 2001 and how it should be judged. The CIA not only waterboarded prisoners, classically known as the Chinese water torture, but slammed them into walls, chained them in uncomfortable positions for hours, stripped them of clothing, and kept them awake for days on end. So like the still secret Senate interrogation report, which is, uh, of course, classified. The Constitution Project study was initiated after President Obama decided in 2009 not to support a national commission to investigate the post-9-11 counterterrorism programs, as proposed by Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont and others. Mr. Obama said that he wanted to look forward, not backward. Aides have said that he feared that his own policy agenda might get sidetracked in a battle over his predecessor's programs. And indeed, what, seemed to, uh, what we seem to have is a kind of gentleman's agreement that uh, these people will not prosecute their uh, predecessors uh, for uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the like, because of their theory that this would induce uh, conflict and instability uh, in the system, apparently. And so, uh, uh, there are no prosecutions of those who are powerful enough or rich enough, actually, to be immune to uh, prosecution like the uh, banksters and so on. Uh, their institutions are too big to fail, and those masters of the universe are too big to jail. So uh, it still goes on. Quoting, this has been a not, uh, not been an easy inquiry for me, Asa Hutchinson, the top Republican on, in this group, uh, said in an interview, he said he thought everyone involved in decisions from Mr. Bush down had acted in good faith in a desperate uh, effort to try to prevent more attacks. Mm -hmm. So they have uh, uh, judged that the uh, motives and intentions of those people who were doing the killing, bombing, torturing, and uh, imprisoning, kidnapping, and so on, uh, their motives and intentions were uh, honorable anyway. And uh, uh, this is what we heard uh, after the uh, Israeli invasion of uh, Gaza, for example, and killed over a <coughs> thousand people there, uh, that uh, uh, their motives and intentions were really good. And there were a number of accidents, of course, unavoidable uh, uh, accidents that resulted in uh, death or injury to hundreds uh, of people. But uh, it's a war, and there's no way to avoid that. So. How these things are justified, typically, and here's the pattern that has emerged. Um, these uh, actions against American interests are uh, called a war or military action. Don't you know there's a war on? It's a war. Now that everything, every conflict is called a war, every criticism of one person, of another person, it seems, or any group, 
is now called, <coughs> instantly called, a war. And uh, the uh, war talk has become so common, so routine, that now we seem to be uh, uh, dismissing it or ignoring it uh, without attention to uh, uh, what is being said or what it's being actually uh, used to justify. So uh, it's not a matter of uh, law enforcement, we're told. It's a matter of uh, uh, war or uh, uh, American uh, military uh, action. It's not law enforcement. The Constitution would seem to set certain constraints on what people can do in enforcing the law. And uh, the commander in chief can free himself of all of that by declaring that it's a military uh, matter. There's a uh, global war going on, a war against terrorism. And so uh, whatever he does, it's a matter of military necessity or national security. And there can be no limits uh, set on that by anyone. He's not answerable to uh, anyone else for who he kidnaps, tortures, and kills. So uh, the emerging line, of course, is that if the president does it, it's legal. This seems to go back to at least uh, Richard Nixon. And uh, we've entered a, a very scary, I think, era uh, that's going to cause, or should be causing us as American citizens uh, some concern. So. Uh, the cat is out of the bag. Uh, some are still claiming that the cat is invisible or uh, doesn't exist. But uh, this is the, the cat in the military helmet. And uh, I think uh, there's cause for concern. The, uh, the American campaign of uh, kidnapping, torturing, uh, and killing people with supposed Ameri anti-American attitudes has become uh, so clear and compelling, it's a wonder that anyone could still try to deny it, although I'm sure many will. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ron. Uh, our friend David Johnson is here. David, you got a take on torture then and now? Well, actually, there's a lot both you and uh, Ron said that I could comment on. Uh, I want to state right off the top that, uh, you know, despite the uh, very slick uh, and uh, very professional propaganda efforts of the uh, U.S. corporate media, 67 percent of the American people oppose these wars. They want the troops home, but yet the, the policy continues and expands. I mean, we have to question whether we still live in a democracy or not. And I have to say <laughs> yeah. this, uh, the only way, if, rather than that we still live in a democracy, the only one way to to tell for sure is that if we the citizens start demanding, start making our, our voices heard uh, by emails, phone calls, and actually showing up at our congressmen and senators' offices and tell them, tell them what we want and not just passively let them run uh, our country into the ground because unfortunately this is what's happening. Um, everybody has, you know, <laughs> Everyone's busy. Everyone has to go to work, or I should say most people have to go to work yeah. every day. They have families. They have responsibilities. And the thing is, it's very difficult for the average American to take the time to do this. But we must. We must, because the, look at what's happening. I mean, these people, this, these 1%, are running our country to the ground. They're bankrupting us. And uh, it, our quality, our standard of living has dropped in the last 30 years. And it's on an exponential level now, just in the, just in the last five years. Now they're talking about cutting Social Security and Medicare, which is a way, uh, in the long term, what they want to do, of course, is to undermine it and eventually privatize it for the benefit of those bankers, the large banks like Goldman Sachs, uh, in order to, the one, same ones who crash the economy. I mean, they want basically, those are the ones, those are the people, it seems like, who are actually running the country, is the financial sector, the large banks. So isn't it time that we, the American people, start taking back control of our democracy? And it's not going to be easy. Um, you know, we saw with the Occupy movement a couple uh, years ago. Gosh, it seems like even longer than that. But, I mean, unfortunately, it was just a flash in the pan. But nevertheless, I think an indication of it was that the vast majority of the American people sympathized with what the Occupy movement was doing, supported it. There were uh, <laughs> Occupy uh, groups meeting uh, and having demonstrations in small towns even all over the United States at the time it was happening, getting all the news coverage in New York City, uh, Oakland, California, and other places. But the thing is, is, you know, Carl's absolutely right. I mean, when Obama 
says that you know he's withdrawn uh, the troops from Iraq. That's a lie. We still have 12 U.S. military bases there and an, an embassy nicknamed the Green Zone that's larger than the Vatican. Um, we still occupy that country. It's just that there's less U.S. troops there, and it's mostly hired mercenaries, um, or they call them contractors. And a, a mercenary is a mercenary um, by any other name, and likewise torture is torture, whether it's by any other name or not. And under no circumstances uh, is torture justified. Because the torture... Torture is the purpose of it is not to obtain information because it's very unreliable to obtain a accurate information uh, using torture because the person being tortured is going to say whatever they think the person wants to hear that's torturing them. The purpose, the main purpose of torture is to terrorize and to intimidate and to break people's resistance, not just the individuals being tortured, but the other people out in the society that are maybe thinking about resisting in some way. That is the purpose of torture, and that's why the torture continues. I mean, do we really want to live in a country that practices torture, that practices endless war, uh, not for the benefit of the American people as far as to protect them or even to enrich them? It's to enrich the wealthy 1%, and it's more and more at our expense, our tax dollars, the lives of our young people in the military, uh, as well as now cutting back on necessary uh, programs uh, like Social Security and Medicare, and in fact, even going to the lengths of starving our public schools and robbing uh, the state pensions. And yes, I'll use that word again, robbing. That's exactly what it is. Uh, these various entities have uh, borrowed the money and then refused to pay it back and are now trying to make the workers pay for it themselves. You know, these issues all sound like they're separate issues, but they're all interconnected. They're all interconnected because we, the American people, no longer control our government, and that must change if we're going to have any kind of uh, future for ourselves and our children and grandchildren. Thank you, David. Um, I have a problem that uh, uh, with a lot of our friends, fellow citizens, uh, people you and I both know and so forth, all three of us do, um, who will say, okay, what you all are saying is fine. It's true, but remember, torture was uh, done by the Bush administration, and Obama put a stop to it. Uh, it's the Republicans who want to cut Social Security and Medicare, and Obama wants to oppose that. I mean, you know, things you talk about really are, are horrors, but the present administration is is doing its best, isn't it? Well, I think the facts show otherwise. <laughs> exactly. I mean, look, I mean, uh, President Obama is talking about how he doesn't care. This is his quotes. He doesn't care what the left wing thinks. He doesn't care right. what the liberal wing of his party thinks, that he's going to do the grand betrayal, I mean, the grand bargain with the <laughs> Republicans had it right the first time. Yeah. to do something that polls have shown that only 20% of the American people support cutting Social Security, and even less, 17% supports cutting Medicare. So what's going on here? Why is uh, all of a sudden President Obama, who, uh, who was reelected on the promise of protecting right. Social Security and Medicare, within months after he's reelected, basically goes on um, you know, um, the bandwagon of, uh, oh, we got to cut Social Security, or we got to cut Medicare, when in fact just the opposite should be happening. Social Security needs to be strengthened. Uh, and expanded because there's rampant age discrimination uh, being practiced in this country at this point in time. And there's people that, frankly, um, you know, that uh, can't get hired after the age of 50. So if that's the case, then lower the retirement age so people can, uh, can retire uh, at, a, at a livable income and allow more jobs for young people. Likewise, Medicare. Medicare needs to be expanded to every man, woman, and child who wishes to have it in this country. Not to be cut, it needs to be expanded. We currently have the highest health care costs in the world, but yet we rank slightly above Uzbekistan in care at, at roughly 37th in the whole world as far as our quality of health care. And the, and the health care prices keep going up and up and up because of the privatized system that President Obama and his buddies, the Republicans, want to expand. we got to understand something here. The Republican and Democratic Party, now there are exceptions. There's definitely individual exceptions, but for the most part, they're on the same team. They're members of the same fraternity. They want the same things for their class of people, which is one per, the one percent. And what we're advocating here is that we want uh, the uh, our country to be for the benefit of the vast majority of the people, the ninety nine percent. You got to take on this, Ron? No. Well, it's, it uh, sounds as if the demon Obama is at the bottom of all of these problems. 
And if we could just get rid of him, then they would uh, all be solved or alleviated anyway. Well, as well, we saw no. the David Bush was bottom of all these problems, if we just get rid of him and get a good guy in and president, everything would be okay. And suddenly we find that Mr. Obama is following Mr. Bush's policies on all the matters we've been talking about today uh, and uh, appoints one of Bush's primary torturers as his, Obama's, head of the CIA. The notion that torture disappeared with uh, the Bush administration is demonstrable false. It continues apparently at Bagram Air Force Base, which the U.S. is running and refusing to turn over to the Afghans uh, in Afghanistan. And it continues at, um, uh, at Guantanamo, uh, which it's in and of itself is a vast scandal for the Bush administration. Uh, the New York Times uh, yesterday morning uh, published one of the most powerful op-eds you will ever read. Uh, that's Glenn Greenwald's judgment. Uh, <clears throat> it's by Samer Naji al-Hassan Makbul, a, Yemen, a Yemeni national who's been in prison at Guantanamo without charges of any kind for more than 11 years. He's one of the detainees participating in the escalating hunger strike to protest both horrible conditions and particularly the supreme injustice of being locked in a cage indefinitely without any evidence of wrongdoing presented or any opportunity to contest the accusations that have been made. The hunger strike escalated over the weekend when guards shot rubber bullets at some of the detainees and forced them into single cells. Mockbell wrote, after a fashion, this op-ed that was in the paper yesterday through an interpreter and a telephone conversation with his lawyers at the human rights group Reprieve. Uh, and it should be read in its entirety because one of the things that it points out, one of the things it points out is the lying by the Bush, by the Obama administration uh, about closing Guantanamo. Um, it's a uh, vast uh, assault on human rights uh, to provide for indefinite detention, uh, as the Obama administration does, of these people. And in Guantanamo, there's no law, there's no legal basis for it at all. In fact, the Constitution stands uh, sharply against it. Uh, the Bush administration had established Guantanamo in Cuba precisely in the hope that it was outside the reign of American law, and therefore the president could do anything he wants there. Um, Obama continues it, in spite of the nonsense of the Bush administration, as outside of American law, uh, with the notion he can do anything that he wants there, maintain people in indefinite detention particularly. And what that really means is pointed up in this op-ed. Uh, this is the Obama administration that's doing these things, not the Bush administration. Torture and assaults on social supports like Social Security and Medicare are coming from the Obama administration. And I, I, one of the biggest problems in American politics today is a lot of good-hearted fellow citizens of ours who look at that and say, oh, well, Obama's being forced to do this by the Congress, or Obama has some uh, uh, there's other things. That he'd like to do the right thing, but just can't. This, my friends, is nonsense. This is the policy of this administration, and that's, what, uh, that's what's accounting for torture, ongoing torture, and assaults on uh, social supports uh, from Social Security through Medicare, et cetera. Okay, I'd like to comment, too, Carl, on that. Uh, you know, uh, Ron, it's not Obama. Uh, it's a systemic problem yeah. is what we have here. Basically is that the 1% control our country, the 99% no longer have a say. Or, the thing is is that I guess the reason we're focused on Obama is because, like Carl said, so many he's people president. are still – he's president, first of all. He has a lot of power. Uh, not ultimate power, but a lot of power. If he really wanted to, he could always, at the very least, he could go on television, nationwide television, and make an appeal directly to the American people to support him. Has that ever happened? No, it hasn't happened. Because he's, he's, he's basically part of this game. It's, it's a, I call it the good cop, bad cop game, like being interrogated by the police. You have two cops who work for the same police department with the same goal. One comes on like a... A hard person, so to speak. I, I can't say what I was going to say on the air. Uh, and the other one comes across like he's your friend and he just wants to help you. Uh, he's trying to keep the other person at bay. It, it's an obvious game. They're on the same team. They want what's for the benefit of the 1%, their class, at our expense. 
the 99 percent. And Obama, I have to say this, he's, you know, I've seen politics for a lot of years now. I'm 55 years old. Um, the first uh, presidential election I remember was Lyndon Johnson against Barry Gold when I was a very young lad. Uh, but I have to say... I voted in that election, Dave, so okay. don't, don't, don't give yourself airs. Okay, yeah. but uh, I have to say, Barack, I've seen a lot of good politicians and bad ones, and a lot of them that were pretty slick. But I have to say one thing. Barack Obama is one of the best liars I've ever seen in my whole life as far as a politician. I mean, I even have to pinch myself sometimes saying, oh, I really want to believe this man. <laughs> but it's true. And there's a reason for that. That's why the 1% picked him. Uh, to be uh, president. Because let's not forget, it. even though the American people, first of all, we had a very limited choice of who really to vote for. Because remember, folks, uh, the National Democrat, the Democratic National Committee and the uh, National Republican Committee control the debates and access to the debates. They, in, in the 2008 debates, if you remember correctly, Dennis Kucinich was still running and they barred him from the debates, even though the primaries hadn't been uh, over yet. Uh, as far as any third parties trying to get out onto the ballot, there's all sorts of uh, very high hurdles and uh, impediments to stop third parties from getting on ballots to run. Not to mention the fact they get very no media attention whatsoever from the corporate media. So, I mean, these are all problems. So understand something. Barack Obama was selected to run to be the choice of the 1%. Basically, you know, they always hedged their bets. So they, you know, the first time around, they kind of didn't care whether it was, uh, you know, John McCain or Barack Obama. Barack Obama was vetted uh, with Vernon Jordan and others a long time, even before he ran for the Senate uh, back in 2006. It's all a selection process. The 1% are controlling our country. We, the people, the 99% need to take back control. You've been watching and we're on the air for the 16th week of 2013. In the second half of our program tonight, we will bring you uh, videos uh, from uh, the ex-actor and now member of Parliament, Glenda Jackson, uh, on the late Baroness Thatcher, uh, Chris Hedges on the actual state of the American economy, uh, a book he's done entitled Days of Destruction. Uh, a note on how your taxes, you paid your taxes yesterday, right? Uh, on how your taxes are actually spent. And finally, uh, a note about a uh, march in Washington uh, on the, uh, uh, against uh, the drone war and its continuation. We want to remind you that there are other programs like ours here on Urbana Public Television, which, by the way, is now streaming online at urbanapublictelevision.org. Uh, and we want to thank our director and producer, Jason Liggett, for his work. Our programs are available on YouTube and Facebook. Search for Aware on the Air. Now, this is Carl Esterbrook for Ron Zoak, Karen Evans-Levy, Stuart Levy, David Johnson, and other members and friends of Aware, saying in the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night and good luck. Mm -hmm.